joining us. Ian Plymer, great to have you back on Outsiders, mate. Thank you. So good to see you. You're looking very well. I'm feeling very well. You've been travelling the world. I certainly have. Fossil fuels. And I have indeed, and excellent. it's wonderful. Putting <laughs> but, have you been, but have you been offsetting your carbon with all of that travel? Uh, yes, I have. I've been drinking uh, bubbly champagne and other things which put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Excellent. excellent. That's my option. Excellent. excellent. That's yeah. my option. That's your penance. Yeah. <laughs> now, listen, talk to us. So, we've seen all the nonsense with Extinction Rebellion and coal is evil, the Labor Party want to climb an emergency. So, let's just throw that question at you. Are we in a climate emergency, Ian Plymer? We live in horribly boring times. <laughs> now, we've had one period in geological history called the Boring Billion. We are in another boring time. Whatever we think is happening, such as extinction or climate change, it's been quicker and greater in the past. We're not in an extinction. We've had five major mass extinctions, and this is when you lose 70% of all species. We have species turnover all the time. Every year a few species cark it, and every year you get a few new species. We're living in one of those times. And the species that we notice that have carked it are the big ones but we don't notice the small species that are growing and creeping up on us. So we're not living in a period of extinction. We are not living in a period of extraordinary climate. We're living in a very benign climate. We are actually still living in an ice age. That ice age started on a Tuesday 34 million years ago, <laughs> and it's still going, and it fluctuates between cold periods, glaciation, and warm periods, and interglacial. We are in one of those interglacials. Those interglacials are driven by that great ball of heat in the sky we call the sun, for some reason, a trace gas has nothing to do with our climate. It's the sun. And if we get further away from the sun, it gets cooler. And if it gets closer to the sun, it gets warmer. Now, no legislation from Canberra or from the UN can change the orbit of the Earth. And the orbit will inevitably put us into another cool period. We've seen it many, many, many times before. These are cycles. And we have climate cycles that are every 400 million years with continents pulling apart and coming back together again. Every 143 million years when we're in a wrong part of the galaxy and we get bombarded by cosmic rays and then orbital cycles every 100,000, 40,000 and 20,000 years and then solar cycles every 1,500, 217, 87 and 11 years, tidal cycles, oceanic cycles. You put a few of them together and bang, the climate will change and very quickly. Rita? Uh, well... Why is everything so short-term then? Because you're looking at it as the history of, of, of the world. You're looking at it millions of years and, and the, the, the history you can document there. But why is everything so short-term when we have, you know, a, a warm summer and then you've got all the climate activists saying, well, this is it, this is... How much more evidence do you need that things are coming to a, a catastrophe? Catastrophe. You know, they're saying that if we don't take dr drastic action today, um, things are going to be very grim for the future of the planet. Well, in my life, I've lived in a period of warming, I've lived in a period of cooling, and I'm now... Then I lived in a period of warming, and I'm now in a period where nothing's happening, where it's neither warming nor cooling. So I've already seen climate change in my life, and it doesn't kill you. Uh, climate change is quite normal. And, in fact, I would be really concerned if climates didn't change. I'd be really worried <laughs> if climate didn't change. So these people are only thinking of me, me and me and me. But what about the man-made contribution to that change? Well, um, I'm optimistic enough that one day someone might find that humans have an influence on climate, <laughs> but I'm yet to see it. But tell, I, tell I'm us, waiting in patience. So tell us about carbon dioxide and then tell us about coal, because uh, the, uh, the Extinction Rebellion and others would tell us that the amount of carbon dioxide is, is cooking us, basically, and we're, we're finished and the last couple of years have been the hottest ever or something like that. Debunk those for me. Please. Well, the last couple of years haven't been the hottest ever. Um, in recorded measuring time... It's been the 1930s. It was much hotter then than now, right across the world. We were in a very hot period of time. The second thing is carbon dioxide is a normal planetary gas. We find it on the moon, we find it on all planets, and planet Earth is leaking out carbon dioxide and methane all the time. You can measure it. Uh, the third thing is that previously in the Earth's atmosphere we had much more carbon dioxide, and the global carbon dioxide content has been reducing through geological time, yet... When we've had carbon dioxide hundreds of times higher than now, we've had ice ages, only six of them, 
but we've had six major ice ages when carbon dioxide was much higher. James, you're frothing at the, at the <laughs> no, mouth. So I'm just curious then, like, I, I, you know, and, and, and I get exactly what you're saying. What I'm curious about <clears throat> is why is it then that carbon dioxide, and this may be less of a scientific than an economic and a philosophical question, why is it that carbon dioxide has become the, uh, the, 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 the sin, I guess, of our modern world that, that we seek to eradicate if there's no connection? Is it because there's money to be made in the transition? Is it because people need something to believe in? What is that all about? Well, the main greenhouse gas in the atmosphere is water vapour. Now, you cannot have a revolution against water. But carbon dioxide is a beautiful symbol to use because all industry in civilised first world countries pumps out carbon dioxide. And therefore, you've got a mechanism of deindustrialising the West by attacking this gas to which industry is held. The second thing is it's a great mechanism for a scam. The third thing is you can't see it, smell it, or oh, taste I'm, it. I have to correct you. Sorry, I'm one, sorry, Greta, one person can. Greta except, Thunberg, Greta can see she it. can see... Except for one uh, kid <laughs> who wags school. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, now, let's talk about, let's talk about coal. Um, how important is coal to Australia? Um, could we survive without it, other than nuclear? Could we survive without coal? Well, coal is compressed solar power. Um, coal derives from plants photosynthesising, these being uh, collected as peat and then ending up as brown coal and ending up as coal with more heat and pressure. Coal is actually compressed sunlight, except it's sunlight that you can use day and night, except if you're in Spain. And in Spain, they actually generate solar power at night. It's incredible. No wonder people go to Spain for their holidays. And it's because the subsidies are so good, you can run a diesel gen set with floodlights on solar panels and still make money. <laughs> <laughs> apart from Spain... Oh, that's apart hilarious. Apart from Spain, that's coal fantastic. is solar power that's compressed and you can use it day and night. Here, <laughs> here we've got coal here on... We've got our man here, our yeah. coal yep. miner here. Now, yep. you can burn yep. that day or night, and what do you do? You produce carbon dioxide, which you put back into the atmosphere, and that's where it came from. And some coals, not the Australian coals, have a bit of sulphur in them, and they put sulphur gases into the atmosphere, you get smog, you get acid rain. Now, but this... our coals don't have it. They are low ash, they're top-quality coals, there's nothing you could do with in the world without coal. You cannot make steel or metals without coal. And if you want to feed yourself or stir your cafe latte uh, with a teaspoon, you need coal to make that teaspoon. Now, this is the biggest part of the fraud which I absolutely loathe, is the fact that well-meaning people think that climate change policies are all about cleaning up pollution, the smog that you referred to. We see places like China, the smog is just disgusting, it's horrible, but that's not the carbon dioxide, but they think it is. They also think the pollution, the plastic in the oceans, which most of it comes from China anyway, they think that is somehow related to climate change. So well-meaning people who want to clean up the planet, a worthy, worthy uh, concept, have been hoodwinked into thinking that carbon dioxide is the villain. Would that be fair? Well, a couple of things. I was in China a few days ago, uh, and you cough your lungs out, your eyes water. Yeah. That is because of poor quality coal and sulphur gases in the atmosphere and particles in the atmosphere. And viewers, you'll be very pleased to know that Sky, you, this program, Bolt, Credlin, they are blocked in China. <laughs> now, that is it's a, a badge, badge of honour. It's a badge of honour. <laughs> Rock and roll. Fabulous. Rock and roll. <laughs> the lefties won for yeah. Australia. I like the sex pistols. Uh, yep. Now, yeah, I, think, right. I think people um, in this country have nothing to fight for. They've got plenty of food. They're extraordinarily wealthy compared with the rest of the world. They carry residual Christian guilt. They're looking for a new <laughs> religion. And so they want to feel guilty about being comfortable. And they can attack a colourless, odourless gas... They can attack industry. <laughs> they can actually feel good by attacking something and thinking that they have a purpose for life. They don't. They might as well shuffle off. Uh, well, climate change. We now say climate change, we're going to say global warming. Uh, was there, or did I imagine this, a fear a couple of decades ago of global cooling? Oh, yes, very much so. In the 70s, uh, newspaper articles were full of it. And they, these are some of the 50 great scams we've had on climate in, in the last 50 years. We are now going to fry and die. 40 years ago, we we're going to freeze. And the scientists were telling us this. Unfortunately, we don't get told that there are cycles of climate and it is quite normal for climate to change. But if it's that 
obvious that how can we have so many people who are well credentialed, who are you know leaders in Rita, the field? Rita, follow the money. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with people feeling this or that. And people use the word believe. I believe in climate change. That's like the catechism. It's a religion. Mm. You cannot believe anything. Belief is in politics and religion, not in <laughs> science. And so people want to believe something. If you're a scientist. There isn't an extinction crisis coming, obviously, because my research funds are going to run out and I will be extinct <laughs> because I'm totally unemployable elsewhere and therefore it's chase the money, follow the money. And one of your guests coming up uh, a little bit later in the show, um, Gideon Rosner, maybe won't talk about following the money of a certain researcher at James Cook University who's made Peter Ridd's life very exciting. And my advice offset to Gideon was follow the money. And that's when you'll find the motivation for having a go at Peter Ridd.